Okay, I have a lot to talk about today, uh, and we move uh, one century, and we move into another culture. Both are very important. We may move from um, uh, um, uh, 17th century England to 18th century France. We move from a situation uh, which was dominated by civil war, chaos, and a yearning for um, a clear sovereign, uh, and we move in a, a century, um, you can call it, of enlightenment. Uh, that's where the um, term enlightenment comes from, the French context, and the century of decadence. Eventually it leads to a revolution, but before the revolution there is a lot of fairly juicy decadence. So, two different epochs and two different cultures. Uh, British individualism, uh, Hobbes and Locke, were methodological individualists. They thought uh, the analysis should start always with the individual. Uh, you remember Hobbes, right? Individual drives and fears, and then he builds up what society is starting always from the individual, not the French. The French are methodological collectivists. They believe there is such a thing as society which is more than the sum total of the individuals. And somehow they know how to grasp it. So these are the changes. What you will see uh, uh, today, Thursday, and next Tuesday, when we will be discussing uh, Montesquieu and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Before we return to British individualism, Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill, don't ask me why this difference between the two uh, cultures, but there is a, a lasting difference. Uh, today's topic is Montesquieu, and I have a lot of fun stories to tell, but I try to limit my anecdotes so I can uh, focus enough on, on the text uh, and do not run out of time um, uh, by the end. Okay, so that was Montesquieu. Uh, uh, he was born um, as Charles Louis de Seconda, Baron de la Brede, uh, was born in 1689 near Bordeaux. Uh, his father was uh, from a noble family, but because he was a younger son, he had to become a mercenary, and in fact he was fighting Turks um, in Hungary. He received a law degree nevertheless, from the University of Bordeaux, um, and uh, in uh, 1715 he did what many aristocrats did, he married a wealthy woman, uh, Jean uh, Lartigue, uh, which was helpful for him because he was not all that very wealthy, uh, though he was a nobleman. Uh, his uncle was a Baron de Montesquieu, and when he passed away, uh, Charles Louis, uh, received uh, his title, he became Montesquieu, um, and inherited his office, the presidency of the Parliament of Bordeaux. Don't think about it, it was not a very big deal, and certainly did not offer income for a luxurious life. was not particularly affluent stuff, and was not uh, particularly powerful stuff. Now a bit about the times. Um, well, here it is, Louis XIV, <laughs> the heights of French absolutism. Uh, well, he, called him, they, he was called the Sun King, and here is his emblem, the Sun. He, you know, the Sun. He is shining like the Sun. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, he actually claimed, that's a famous sentence, and important to understand Montesquieu, l'état c'est moi, uh, I am the state. Well, was a kind of an overstatement. Not quite. He pretended to be more powerful than he actually was. The French absolutism shows, did show already it cracks. And the bourgeoisie was becoming already quite powerful. 
under the times of Louis XIV. But he had the notion of French gloire, the glory, right? And, uh, and he built this wonderful palace of Versailles, showing what gloire or glory is. Uh, 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 President de Gaulle, right, also emphasize, emphasize the French gloire. The French are very fond of it. Okay, the 18th century was the century of enlightenment. They call the siècle of lumière. Lumière means the light. Um, well, it was Descartes uh, who transformed philosophy towards uh, 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 the cold view, cold look of reason. And that was the one which was spreading in 18th century um, uh, England, culminating in the 1789 revolution. And we see two major steps in this direction, Montesquieu and Rousseau. Uh, uh, well, one of the major um, accomplishments of the Enlightenment were the publications of Encyclopédie, uh, the sort of predecessor of British Encyclo Encyclopedia Britannica, our Didro and D'Alembert edited and which put together rationalistic scholarship of their time. Well, here you have the first edition of uh, Encyclopédie. Uh, well, uh, as uh, Louis XIV passed away, his five-year-old uh, great-grandson, uh, um, uh, Louis XV, became the king and ruled for a very long time. Well, uh, the decay of um, absolutism and royal authority continued, and we are really entering now uh, with uh, uh, 1715, um, one probably the longest in modern history, the longest epoch of decadence and sexual permissiveness. It's interesting kind of seem to recur in human history, right? Then you had a similar kind of uh, permissiveness and sort of decadence, uh, 1890s until 1914, probably 1930, and then the 1960s, of course, right? Then everything goes. Uh, well, this was a, a, a time of this kind. Well, um, he was not particularly interested in governing, but um, uh, he was very interested in be beautiful women. Uh, well, he was quite a good-looking guy when he was young as well, so I'm sure women were quite interested in him too. And you know the name. Madame Pompidour uh, was uh, uh, the most famous and most influential uh, of his uh, mistresses. As I said, it was becoming right a time of uh, sexual permissiveness, uh, promiscuity, uh, pretty widespread, uh, also affected Montesquieu. Here is uh, Madame Pompidou, uh, indeed a very beautiful person. But not only uh, beautiful, she was extremely smart as, as far as we can tell. He wa was an intellectual of very distinguished state, taste. He knew all people of the Enlightenment, uh, Voltaire, uh, one of the big troublemakers of his time. Um, he supported Diderot and the project of Encyclopédie, uh, which is, uh, was unusual because, you know, royal authority did not really like uh, this one. Well, and let me uh, uh, just give you a little ethnography, if you are interested. Les liaisons dangereuses. Uh, uh, Pierre Chordelo Laclos uh, wrote a novel about the sexual mores of this time, which is called The Dangerous Relationships, Les Liaisons Dangereuses. Uh, well, there was two movies out of made of it, and anybody watched any of these movies? Nobody watched it. Wonderful movie. Well, there are two versions. One by Roger Vadim, uh, and that puts the whole story in... Uh, French society of its time, and the other one is an American one, Stephen Fares, and it is Glenn Close, uh, uh, 
uh, who features in it. Uh, now, this is the Pierre Vadim movie. You can borrow it. Do. You will have fun. And you will have an understanding, right? But meet an um, 18th century in France was, and where Montesquieu and Rousseau are coming from. And of course, this is the American version with Clem Close. She's already, ah, you know, the person what she likes to play, right? Um, <laughs> uh, the vicious woman. Okay, um, now uh, Montesquieu, uh, well, he lives in the century of enlightenment and promiscuousness. He sells his office, uh, though I mean he mainly lives from the verse of his wife. Uh, starts a wine business, but then he leaves the wine business to the wife, and he begins to travel in Europe and in England. Uh, then when he returns, he settles in Paris, leaves the wife back, you know, to run the wine business, uh, um, and he uh, beginning to write. Uh, he writes, uh, uh, publishes in 1721, already the Parisian letters. I talked about this before, and uh, uh, then he was elected on the basis of this to Académie Française, uh, the French Academy of uh, Sciences and Art, a very big accomplishment at this very early age. And finally, 1748, he publishes the major book. Um, this is really a very important book. Um, uh, I hope you did what I asked. You glanced at it. Not an easy read. A bit drier uh, than some of the texts we read, but very important, fundamentally important stuff. Did you ask him to uh, write something uh, for the Encyclopédie about democracy? But he's bored with the question of democracy. He wrote enough about this, so he writes an article on taste. Okay, and he died in 1755 in Paris. So these are the times, and this is your author, uh, um, Montesquieu. Uh, now let me move on to uh, the work. So here we go. The Spirit of the Laws, and here is the first edition. So what is this book? Uh, the first part is the law in general and different modes of governance. Uh, interesting, not path-breaking. Uh, this is not what he will be remembered for. Though I mean that he is opening some very important subject matters. The second one is law and politics and separation of powers. We will see, right, he builds uh, on Locke and takes Locke him a big way forward. Great improvement in many, you know, to the extent there is improvement. Of course, Locke has some insight which is missing from the Montesquieu formulation of separation of powers. Uh, then he has this extraordinary section on law and climate. Uh, uh, this is one of his big contributions. Uh, um, I will show you, I mean, the way how he formulated is extremely naive, uh, um, almost borders on the ridiculous. But uh, given uh, the 21st century, there are very few people, with the exception of Ibn Khaldun, whom I named already right, in the introductory lecture, who was so sensitive that society lives in this globe, right, and how society is formed and structured and how its laws are being shaped is actually greatly influenced uh, by the nature of environmental and climatic conditions. So he is the first of ecologists. He is the first environmentalist, right, who understand the interaction between social organization Mores, ethics, ideas, and society, right? Uh, um, and then there, there, there is a bit on law and commerce. I will very briefly talk about this. 
Law and religion, and I will skip this section altogether. And law and history, I also skip. So what are the main themes? First, you know, will be about classification of governments. Then I will talk about separation of powers. And then environment, law, and social structure. Right? These are the issues we will be rushing through. There's a lot of stuff uh, to uh, 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 look at it. Well, before Montesquieu, uh, the question when they classified government was who rules? Who is the sovereign? Montesquieu changes somewhat the discourse. He is interested in the manner of governments. How people who are in authority rule. Uh, uh, the real basic distinction whether a government is moderate or whether it is despotic. Now, what are the questions in, when you try to judge uh, uh, the nature of a government? One important question you, he said you should ask, are the various powers separated or not? Uh, uh, irrespective who rules, whether it can be a king, it can be an elected president, it can be a prime minister. The question is, are uh, the power separated. And the next question is, this is very important, why do people obey? The question why people obey orders is touched upon by Hobbes and Locke, but it's not really elaborated. This is the issue, what we will call the question of legitimacy, right? What are the principles why we obey orders? Uh, and we will see uh, much later in this course, that it will be Max Weber who elaborates on this issue at great length. Um, and then the next question is, okay, is the ruler an individual or is this an institution? You see, this is all a very interesting enrichment of the idea what the nature of governments are. He himself supports a constitutional monarchy. Uh, he supports um, um, a, a monarchy, right, in which there is a king or queen, but a uh, king and queen which operates on the rule of law. That's what constitutional monarchy is. The second major theme is separation of powers. I'm still elaborating what will come. Well, uh, you have read uh, Locke distinguished between legislative, executive, and federative branches of government. Montesquieu uh, distinguishes between legislative, executive, and juridical. Well, this is the one uh, which is, has been so influential on the American Constitution, what we all believe now in this country, that these are the three branches which should be separated. Though, of course, the federative remains to be an interesting issue. Who should exercise federative powers, the powers of war? Should it uh, the legislature, or should it be at the executive branch uh, as such? Now, uh, Montesquieu suggests that the three powers will have to be separated. The legislative power, uh, and this is a, a departure uh, from Hobbes and Locke, uh, should be by elected representatives. And then he makes an important uh, new contribution. He said, the right of minority should be respected. Uh, though he kind of foreshadows something like universal um, um, uh, uh, voting, though he is not quite explicit about this, but you can read into it. But then he said, the minority's right should be um, uh, reserved. And he said, well, the legislative power cannot and should not be held by the monarchs, but, and, uh, but it has to be limited. There must be a limitation on legislative powers. Um, uh, and the executive will exercise checks over the legislature. Um, and we will, uh, again, talk about this in more detail. Uh, and, but there must be some checks and balances over the executive branch as well. Um, when it comes, you know, who controls what, he puts more emphasis on the executive limiting uh, the legislatives than the other way around. 
but uh, we will see what the arguments are and what the rationale for this is and how this affects, for instance, the functioning of the U.S. government today. I think it is not all that far away for the blueprint uh, Montesquieu um, established, laid back um, in uh, uh, the mid um, 18th century. And then the last issue will be environment, uh, how social conditions are shaped uh, uh, by environment on, on conditions. But he said, but there is also a general spirit, a spirit which is above the individuals. And this is the very French theme, right? You cannot explain it from the individual. There is some general idea. Durkheim will call collective conscience. Rousseau will call it the general will, right? The very French idea, right? That there is some consciousness above the individual consciousnesses. This has formulated so powerfully first time uh, by uh, 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 Montesquieu. And he actually said that civilization is progressing, the influence of the natural conditions declines, and the importance right, of general spirits increases. Or to put with Durkheim, the collective conscience becomes more and more important. I'm just foreshadow that you have a sense, right, that this course really hangs together, right? We are not talking about separate authors. We are talking about a set of authors who are talking to each other, debating each other, right? That's, I think, what is so fascinating about the foundations of modern social thought. Um, uh, that cannot be said about 20th or 21st century social theorizing, where we are at each other's throats and we ignore each other, right? That's uh, uh, more typical. Okay. Um, as I said, you know, he's a methodological collectivist, right? And let just explain this to you a little, right? Methodological individualist who begins in order to develop a conception of society, you have to start with uh, the individual. The only reality what you can observe in individual action and individual consciousness. Everything else, right, what you suggest is speculative, right? This is British individualism and empiricism, right? The French emphasizes there are stuff like law. This is why the legal system, the law, is so important for Montesquieu. That's why the major book is called, like, The Spirit of Law. Because the law is not simply a sum total, right, of individual consciousness. It stands over us, right? And we get into a society and the law, the legal system, already does exist. If you see, Durkheim does the same thing. This is why the legal system is so important for him. Okay, now let's move into um, the first uh, theme and talk about uh, the different forms of government. Now... He makes a distinction between republican government, uh, monarchy, um, and despotic state. Republican government, in his definition, means that either the people uh, 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 rule democracy, or a subset of people, right? Aristocracy has the sovereign power, are the source of law. Um, as we will see, he is not all that certain whether the people rule is all that good, right? He prefers sort of selected aristocracy. It will be even true for Rousseau, who is much more radical than he is. Monarchy, in which one alone governs, uh, but by fundamental laws. Uh, the monarch itself is bound by, by laws. Um, uh, a despotic state that there are no fundamental roles, right? The despot exercises its power at its will. Uh, Adolf Hitler's Germany uh, or Stalin's Russia or Soviet Union are despotic states, right? That there is no proper rule of law. Now about uh, the republic. Well, as we said, there are two forms of it, the democratic and then the arist aristocratic one. In the democratic, you have a selection of people to office by lot. Well, he's not talking about elections, but by lot. And indeed, in Greek democracies, people were occasionally selected to ma major offices, right, in ancient Greek, by lot, by lottery. Um, in aristocracy, people are selected by choice, right? 
the best people get into the office that they have the best skills to perform. Then he said, well, everyone can vote, but not everybody is prepared to serve in the office. That speaks right for uh, 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 arist aristocrats by choice. But uh, whatever the republic is, there is a principle, legitimacy, is based on virtue. The person who served should be virtuous, right? And if the virtuousness of the person is questioned, then, you know, the legitimacy of the person is in some trouble. Uh, verbally, the virtuousness. Remember Bill Clinton? He ran into some trouble, you know, because people started to question his virtuousness, right? In the very narrow sense of the term. Okay, anyway, that's the guiding principle. Then monarchy. Well, here the prince has a sovereign power, um, is the source of law. But once the law is established, the prince has to follow that law. That's monarchy. And the principle here is honor. The prince has to be honorable, right, in order to be obeyed. Again, the basis of legitimacy is honor. And despotism, as we have seen, the one who governs uh, can do whatever it wants to do, is above the law, right? Uh, and what is the principle of despotic rule? Fear, right? You obey those in power because you fear them. Now, the next theme is separation of powers. And we see the th three powers. Well, there are right, the legislative power, executive power, and we will see the power to judge later on. Um, executive power over things, depending on the right of nations. Um, executive power over things, depending on civil rights. Um, he said the first power, executive power, uh, 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 executive, you know, legis legislative power, uh, in fact, uh, uh, can be exercised by a king or a magistrate. Uh, it can be exercised by even an elected body. Uh, but the second one, executive power, uh, well, uh, it has to be executed, he believed, uh, by, um, uh, usually by a monarch. Uh, and there is the last power, the power of judging, uh, which has to be separated from both uh, the um, uh, um, legislative and executive power. Let, let's see the argument, what he puts forward. He said, when the legislative power is united with the executive power in a single person, there is no liberty. Uh, because one can fear, right, that the same monarch who made uh, um, tyrannical rules will execute them in a tyrannical manner. So therefore, you have to separate legislative and uh, executive power. Well, this separation is not complete, right? Because it takes time for the legislative body to pass laws. And therefore, very often, executives, uh, even in the United States, um, operate with executive orders, right? These executive orders kind of substitute, right, for laws or legal regulations, right? So the separation, even in modern society like the United States, is relative. And in fact, uh, uh, many constitutional lawyers in the United States were concerned during the last two administrations that the executive branch too often operated by executive orders, right? Rather than to ask uh, uh, the legislature, right, to legislate about uh, uh, those things. Um, oh. Okay. Uh, now, um, he, then he goes on and he said, look, uh, uh, this is not really a question of a republic versus monarchy. Uh, he said, look, in, in his times, in most kings of, of Europe, uh, the government is quite moderate. Um, uh, 
he said, well, the prince who exercises uh, uh, the first two powers, uh, well, uh, leaves uh, uh, a great deal of uh, autonomy for its uh, uh, subjects. In the Italian republics, they are republics in, of his time, 18th century, the powers are united, and there is less liberty, actually, in these Italian republics. Well, it's an interesting uh, um, point. Uh, uh. Now, about the legislative power. He said, well, uh, it's better to be an elected body which exercises uh, the legislative power, passes the laws, uh, and become close to the idea of universal suffrage in choosing the representative. All citizens should have the right to vote. And then comes the qualification, except who said is so humble that they are deemed to have no will of their own. In order to have a will, you better be, be a property owner. Right? There is a suggestion here of property qualification, which was quite dominant in the United States um, until the 20th century. Right? Um, uh, uh, in, um, but on the other hand, he elaborates on it, uh, uh, people should not enter government except to choose their representatives. Right? Because in order to be in the executive, uh, you need skills. Um, well, you may know who could be the right person uh, to run uh, the office, but you may not be able to run the office. Right? That's the fundamental idea. Uh, Well, it's also important, right, that this representative body, the legislature, uh, uh, should be separated from uh, actual action. Now comes the idea, right, the right of minority. This is a novel idea cast in a very conservative way. But though it is cast in a conservative, kind of feudal, aristocratic manner, and aristocratic speaking, is formulating a very important principle what we are still struggling with, right? How to defend the rights of minorities against the despotism of the majority. Just because 51% voted one day does not mean that 49% is wrong, right? And that the rights of that 49% or even just 1% in some days has to be guaranteed. And that's what he's struggling with. Now here, in this context, and we'll put the citation uh, on the web, so I don't want to re read this very long citation, the argument is for uh, the nobility. He said, well, the nobility has more rights, and therefore if they have more rights, more stakes in it, they have more than one voice. Therefore the solution is a two-chamber solution, right? a chamber for the aristocrats, an upper house, and a chamber popularly elected by everyone, a lower house. Well, not in the aristocratic sense, but in some ways representing the defense right, of small states and agrarian states. This is by the United States Senate. Every state sends two senators, rather, irrespective of the size of the population. Right? Uh, and therefore, uh, though not in a um, uh, uh, sort of feudalistic way as Montesquieu meant it, but it is, the whole proposition is very much alive right, in our cu current uh, political practices. Uh, okay, let me then move on and talk about the executive power. Now, the executive power uh, should be stable. That's why he believes it better be in the hands of a monarch. Right? Because the government needs uh, immediate action. It cannot leave right, to, to messy Congress to debate things all the time. Uh, the government has to act instantly. And therefore, um, it has to be in one hand. Uh, well, there are uh, all, uh, he elaborates a number of limits of legislative power. Some of it applies to the United States, others don't, but may apply to Western democracies. 
it should convene at regular intervals. And that's quite true for all democratic states, right? The legislature is called very often um, uh, and uh, with some regularity. Well, it should not be in session without interruption. Uh, the U.S. Uh, 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 Congress is virtually right in session almost without interruption, but other parliament in uh, continental Europe are not necessarily so. The reason is that it, they don't want to make uh, uh, membership in the legislature the sole source of occupation and income. And there are things which speak for this idea, right? That the legislature is not in permanent uh, session. And then he said it should not have the right to convene itself. Well, uh, the U.S. Co Congress convenes itself. It doesn't need the call of the executive. But in England, for instance, right, it is the Queen who dissolves the parliament and calls the session of the parliament. doesn't give her much power, but nevertheless, uh, it, uh, uh, the, the idea, the Montesquieu idea, is present in a number of Western democracies. Uh, now, uh, regular intervals, that's obvious, right? We, it should not be left to the executive, especially if the executive has the right to call into session the legislature, right? That may mean the executive will not call when new laws are needed and will become a despotic. That's why it has to be uh, 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 called by uh, uh, regular intervals. Uh, uh, and uh, it, uh, you know, it uh, uh, should not be in session without interruption because he said it would ob overburden uh, the executive power as well. Uh, and it cannot convene itself, he said, and the arguments are known because if it would um, uh, have the right uh, to decide whether it uh, dissolves itself, it will never dissolve itself. That's the fundamental argument here. As I said, in many countries, this is exercised in the way. Now, the executive, he said, uh, should be able to check over the legislature. Uh, um, and uh, uh, in what way? Uh, because it doesn't want the legislature uh, to um, uh, paralyze the action of the government. Um, and uh, the main way uh, how uh, the um, executive exercises checks over the legislature is the veto right of the executive, exactly like it is done in the U.S. Constitution, right? Uh, the president can veto laws which are passed by Congress, has to send back to Congress, and the Congress has to overrule right, the veto of the president. But there is a clear light check of the um, uh, executive over the legislature, right? Uh, the executive has the possibility to remind uh, uh, the legislature this may be a bad idea to pass this law. You better rethink it before it becomes a law. Well, checks and balances over the executive branch. He is quite a conservative here. Uh, he said the executive power belongs uh, uh, to the legislative only through its faculty uh, of uh, uh, vetoing. Uh, the executive power, uh, 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 yeah, it's very important, right, enacts uh, the rising of public funds uh, 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 only with the consent of legislature. This is again a very important principle the, uh, ruling all democracies, uh, that the budgets have to be improved uh, by the legislature. Um, just see the mass, uh, what we have seen in California recently, right? By the, where the legislature was not giving the budget uh, to the governor. Um, uh, but this is certainly a very important principle of democracy. Uh, and now uh, let me come to the question of environment and society and the whole idea uh, that uh, the physical condition shape uh, 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 social conditions. And let me give you a couple of, uh, as I said, quite silly notes. Uh, he said, the spirit and passion are extremely different in various climates. 
laws should be relative to the differences in these passions. And now comes the real silly one. Cold in cold climate, the blood is pushed harder for the heart. This produces confidence in oneself and courage and better knowledge. So you are more courageous, more active, and smarter if you live in cold climates uh, 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 like in France uh, or in England. People in hot countries are timid like old men. And I'm not all that timid. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly, you know, to sort of distance himself from racism, uh, a term which did not exist in his time, he said, even the children of Europeans born inside the Indies lose the courage of the European climate. Uh, at least it is... Uh, 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 not uh, based on a racial argument, but indeed made, based on an extremely naive uh, ecological argument. But let me emphasize that it's fantastic insight here, right? Um, for another 200 years, nobody took the environment seriously. I mean, with the exception of Emil Durkheim, we will talk about this when we talk about Durkheim coming from Montesquieu. For Durkheim, Montesquieu and Rousseau were the gods, right? That's where um, modern theory of society came from. It was Montesquieu and Rousseau, uh, both of them. So, uh, and now about the general spirit. He said, there are many things government, climate, religion, laws, the maxims of government, mores and manners, uh, there is this all adds together a general spirit which is formed as a result, right? I hope you get the idea of the general spirit, right? That there is a set of ideas which is above our individual consciousness. In childhood we learn, right? We internalize those ideas. It is not coming from the individual, it is entering the individual in the process of education, right? And therefore, the argument what Montesquieu makes, repeated by Rousseau and Durkheim, that we can have and should have an idea of society or collective consciousness standing over and above the individual. This is a big debate, right, which informs most of the debates in social sciences today, in economics, in political science, in sociology, in anthropology, you have some scholars who regard themselves in economics few, methodological collectivists, and those uh, who call themselves methodological individualists. Rational choice people, right, are the methodological individualists. The cultural analysts are methodological collectivists, right? We have that distinction virtually everywhere, as I said, least in economics, but even in economics, you have the institutionalists, right, who are on the edge, right, of between being methodological collectivists or being methodological individualists. Uh, and then, uh, well, he says, as civilization unfolds, uh, the uh, importance of the general spirit is increasing and the impact of uh, climate is uh, uh, declining. Not that climate doesn't matter, but over time its important declines and the, the, the importance of general spirit increases. Well, that's about it for today. Thank you.